Dear uh, Yelena Mikhailovna, dear friends and colleagues, uh, um, when I uh, have this uh, uh, most uh, undeserving, mingly warm words, I can only say that see, these words of welcome are only regarded by me uh, uh, as uh, uh, a recommendation for me to improve. I know that I really do not deserve uh, um, those uh, very lofty praise uh, that uh, I hear uh, uh, from uh, from the founder of the Moscow School, uh, a person whom I uh, uh, hold in highest uh, esteem, uh, uh, Dr. Elena Nimirovska. I'm very thankful. Uh, for this school to exist because uh, it is indeed, uh, in my view, uh, a most important uh, structure in the life of uh, the contemporary Russian society. Developing of, uh, of uh, civics and indeed uh, uh, helping uh, to cultivate uh, the political class of all uh, tasks uh, that Russia faces today, it is uh, uh, a task of, of highest importance. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, that this political class uh, has often to be cultivated outside of Russia, which is a tragedy uh, to me, a clear tragedy uh, which has been uh, caused uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the ruling uh, um, uh, Russian uh, group or regime uh, which uh, is ready to sacrifice uh, the national interest for its uh, narrow uh, uh, clique interest. Uh, for this reason, we have uh, to meet in Stockholm, in Oxford, and elsewhere, and not in Moscow. Now, this is not good. But uh, at least what is good is that we can still gather and we can still convene and that we can still talk, uh, however difficult it is uh, for us to travel to Oxford rather than travel to Golitsyno. However, I trust that we shall continue to do this for this uh, to, to keep up this mission. And I am sure that the moment will come uh, uh, when you will be people of high demand in Russia. But having uh, remembered uh, what we have gone through the past 125 year, 100, 100 years indeed, uh, you will have to be more responsible for your actions. And we do hope that you will not have to repeat the mistakes uh, that have been made. Uh, so with these uh, words of, of uh, gratitude for you to be here and for, uh, for the invitation of the organizers uh, to have invited me, I shall start uh, talking about uh, the origins of the Russian imperial uh, nationalism. The question which is uh, of uh, extremely high uh, uh, moment uh, and uh, import uh, in uh, Russia and, uh, and the world. Uh, in Europe, uh, in the United States, uh, because um, Russia in its uh, new guise uh, is viewed as a dangerous uh, actor in the international arena. So the question really is how deep uh, are these imperious attitudes uh, and uh, what uh, may these entail? I shall start by saying that the studies of mass political consciousness uh, are acquiring special relevance. Uh, we have uh, a whole series of new phenomena, of which one is this imperious uh, uh, consciousness. Uh, these phenomena may be regarded as new because uh, they have uh, a content uh, uh, somewhat different from what we, or substance somewhat different from what we had before. Of course, political consciousness has always been there, but uh, up until the 19th century, um, uh, common people were hardly ever engaged with politics, except for cases of, uh, of war or transition uh, uh, of the country uh, from one crown to another crown. But other than that, uh, 
people uh, were hardly ever concerned with politics, uh, which was, of course, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, exclusive uh, field of the elites. It changed in the 19th century, first in Europe and then in, uh, in Russia. Um, in many ways, under the influence of the mass media, uh, which is, as I understand, uh, one of the uh, main subjects of this seminar. Now, this, of course, was uh, directly related uh, to uh, spread of literacy and uh, uh, so-called alphabetization, uh, which uh, led the society to be involved into the political processes. Throughout uh, one to two centuries, uh, uh, we have arrived at the universal suffrage, uh, the involvement into the political process, uh, and uh, this uh, naturally uh, led uh, uh, to, uh, to the further uh, emancipation uh, of uh, different uh, layers uh, of uh, the modern societies. With the advent uh, of radio, and uh, and a mass spread of uh, printed paper. Uh, uh, the, the mass media changed uh, the uh, nature of uh, of uh, political attitudes, but not in a fundamental way. Because the mass media allowed uh, for one important political consequence, which is an ability to control the minds of others. As far as uh, the uh, rustics uh, uh, were just uh, sowing and plowing, it was uh, quite enough uh, for the bishop uh, to read uh, once a year an address from the monarch, and that would be sufficient. But when people started to read the paper and they started to listen to the radio, uh, they immediately s uh, sprang a desire to indoctrinate people, in other words, to doctor the public uh, consciousness and to instill into the minds uh, of, uh, of the masses uh, uh, an ideology uh, which may be um, uh, serving the purposes of the ruling class. In England, the country where we are, uh, uh, the control over a spread of information, even in the 19th century, uh, was inadmissible. But in many other countries, including the Russian Empire, uh, the mass media were exactly the instrument of, uh, of political influence. And uh, in this way, uh, the societies were made to share uh, those uh, uh, values that the government professed. Now, one might remember uh, that uh, the newspaper of Struve, of Gleb Struve, was uh, uh, brought uh, from abroad. It was uh, uh, printed on uh, on the so-called uh, uh, cigarette uh, paper, very thin paper. The same uh, uh, relates uh, to the Bell um, newspaper of uh, Herzen. Um, but uh, uh, when uh, the censorship was abolished uh, in 1917, uh, then, of course, the Bolshevik uh, uh, papers uh, flooded the country and indeed changed the consciousness of of the young uh, uh, and of the of the illiterate. So the totalitarian regimes uh, um, have to uh, keep uh, uh, the mass media under strict control. I um, belong uh, to the uh, generation uh, of people who had to listen to the BBC and the Voice of America uh, through the background noise. And uh, of course, we were uh, knowing and, and, and learning a lot of uh, uh, things about the world. Well, this situation changed yet again um, in, a, in a very radical way um, in the beginning of the 21st century. This control over information and uh, uh, this freedom of information through the inf information today, uh, one may say, is realized uh, uh, in its uh, uh, almost uh, um, uh, absolute entirety. Mm. And uh, with even with, with those uh, limitations that exist in, in some countries, uh, still the Internet uh, is uh, indeed uh, the closest approximation to the idea of uh, freedom of information that I think the mankind has achieved. So we are uh, witnessing a new phenomenon. If 
it was believed previously that the society must control the flow of information to manipulate the public consciousness, and then today, in the 21st century, we have uh, 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 been uh, uh, startled to learn that the society is interestingly uh, predisposed for uh, self-filtering or even uh, cutting out uh, the information which is undesirable. So uh, the uh, attitudes or stereotypes uh, which were uh, indeed uh, hammered into the public consciousness uh, have some value to the society, and the society and, uh, or the people by and large are not prepared to uh, seek uh, accurate information on the web, and they're happy to be uh, to be led into into illusions. This is what we have uh, indeed discovered during the Ukrainian crisis, when the Russian internet was wide open. One could read Ukrainian newspapers, one could read uh, English newspapers, one could read in Russian, one could read in all languages and all sources. However, the people were only reading what they liked and what they wanted to believe. Uh, in this way, they were supporting the regime, not because they were deceived, because indeed the information was right there around the corner, but because they were ready to be deceived. In other words, uh, people knew that they were uh, that they were being lied to, because uh, everybody, um, it, it appears uh, no surprise that, that the uh, Russian soldiers uh, did take part uh, in the in the battles uh, um, in the south uh, uh, east of, uh, of, of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, if this were to be said in public, uh, you would indeed be, uh, you would indeed be, um, uh, ostracized as a uh, nearly a traitor. So this was uh, uh, what I call uh, society-generated censorship, society-generated uh, uh, filtering. So we are seeing a situation which is probably a lot more serious than an eye curtain imposed by a totalitarian state. We are seeing uh, self-perpetrated uh, uh, blinds uh, that people uh, have uh, been indeed deceiving themselves with because the truth was so unpleasant, so disgusting to, to those who did not want uh, to see it. Uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, in the Christian asceticism, uh, this has been uh, known when a man uh, only wants uh, and uh, uh, hears what he wants uh, to hear uh, and see. But on the other hand, uh, this is also the result uh, of uh, the past uh, epoch of the totalitarian control over the information when people were indoctrinated. And one of these ideas concerning the Russian society is indeed the idea of imperious grandeur, imperious consciousness. This idea has a big and glorious past, and we shall talk about this. But what is important uh, to us, uh, for us to understand, I think, is that this idea of imperious attitude of mind is a lot wider than, than just uh, uh, Russian or political uh, mm, thing, because We can see uh, this as a pleasure of uh, reigning over the freedoms of other, of others. Man, and this is a bad quality uh, necessarily, a poor, a bad quality because uh, uh, it, it, it. But but we do have it as humans. So this this uh, um, exulting in power over. Uh, over the freedoms of ours, of, 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 of the fr over the freedom of others, uh, something that even God does not allow himself to do according uh, to the uh, uh, Christological uh, doctrine, because uh, um, uh, man's will is free uh, and uh, is free to make mistakes and commit sins. Uh, so uh, this power over others' uh, freedoms is a 
bad quality that every one of us has, and it is indeed uh, expressed uh, on the political level uh, through different means, including the imperious attitude. This can be a dictatorship or an empire. The specific quality of an empire is that uh, the monarch uh, is uh, indeed uh, ruling over many nations, uh, each one of which uh, would like to live a different life uh, other than the imperial uh, title uh, nation. But because of the circumstances, the different circumstances, be it suppression um, or or geopolitical uh, circumstances, uh, or uh, they these uh, uh, nations have to to obey. Pax Romana, the Roman Empire, is uh, the classical and probably the most uh, conspicuous uh, um, uh, format of the empire that we know. Uh, and when uh, uh, an edict or a decision was uh, taken in uh, Rome, uh, it was mandatory throughout this enormous country, uh, even though the uh, nations of this empire had uh, their very uh, different and distinct interests. Uh, so uh, as any empire, uh, it had its uh, pluses uh, or, or advantages and its uh, drawbacks. And uh, eventually, of course, uh, uh, the empire collapsed. One has to say that this power of uh, other nations uh, is uh, indeed quite uh, kindred to the power of uh, other individuals. And indeed, uh, uh, I think that this is an inebriating in sensation. So I think that uh, uh, to rule, one has to give back. But uh, the summit of this is the pleasure of power. In this sense, uh, we uh, seize uh, the uh, actual uh, peculiarities of the empire. So when the imperial system uh, collapses, uh, it leads uh, uh, to uh, uh, the great uh, um, crisis of the imperial nation per se, because the title nation uh, always believes that an empire is is good for it. Because even in the in the liberal societies such as uh, uh, such as Britain, uh, it went through a very painful period uh, uh, of of losing the British Empire. As the English like to say, uh, the first superpower of the modernity. Uh, uh, which, of course, it was. And uh, um, McKindle uh, called uh, the British Empire in his first work of 1904. Uh, then he moved away from this uh, somewhat uh, insane views, but at that time he was calling this the first superpower, the only superpower. Um, we know that in France, uh, the collapse of the empire led uh, to, uh, to General de Gaulle um, ascending uh, to power, and uh, indeed uh, uh, the society was uh, uh, quite unhappy uh, that uh, the colonies uh, went away. In Germany, as uh, we remember, the defeat in uh, the First uh, World War and uh, the loss of, uh, of uh, territories uh, led uh, to uh, the uh, led uh, to um, the Nazis coming to power in 15 years. So it is always a very painful thing, and one has to be extremely cautious. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is a painful consciousness, uh, but this is uh, nothing but uh, a very common disease uh, of nations, uh, just as it uh, one as 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 individuals uh, may have. Uh, um, uh, uh, a psychiatric condition. This is a psychiatric condition of whole nations. And Nazism showed this um, because uh, the Weimar Republic uh, was a, a free uh, republic uh, uh, in terms of the freedom of expression, and the German people uh, leaned uh, to the radical um, uh, propaganda of the Nazis. So, in in other ways, uh, in other words, uh, this was uh, an expression of the will of the German people, just as which, uh, just as much as as the Russians themselves leaned towards uh, the Bolsheviks. Uh, one has to realize this. Uh, but in countries of democratic arrangement, um, in countries of liberal economies, uh, a collapse of an empire is not so dramatic. Why? It is because empires uh, uh, 
which have uh, kept uh, uh, colonial empires or empires under democratic form of government, such as England or France, uh, they certainly exploited the colonies uh, and the empires in the interest of, say, the, Ingl the British people or the English people and the French people. This was, of course, uh, the controlled uh, markets, uh, source of uh, cheap labor, uh, source of um, different uh, uh, raw uh, materials uh, and some strategic interests. Uh, uh, but uh, other than that, uh, the metropolitan uh, nations were uh, gaining uh, great, uh, uh, greatly from the exploitation of the colonies, which is totally immoral, but at least useful to the title nation. When uh, the colonies uh, in the political form became inconvenient, uh, when, uh, when the people's uh, revolt in the colonies uh, led uh, uh, to, to exacerbation of the administration uh, uh, over colonies, uh, such as uh, uh, the um, Indian experience, and on the other hand, uh, when we can see that the economy becomes uh, more and more uh, uh, liberal, liberal, and when economic uh, means uh, um, ends could have been uh, uh, met without the political uh, means, then uh, colonies, colonies became redundant. England, having shed uh, the, or, or Britain having shed uh, the colonies, uh, did not uh, become poorer. France uh, did not become poorer because, after all, uh, these countries could save uh, on uh, the huge expenses uh, they had to under to incur in in governing uh, the colonies. Um, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, uh, one knows uh, the great uh, disparity in the cost of labor uh, in Europe and in, in the colonies, uh, and so on and so forth. So it is a, a new form of uh, colonialism, as it was called neocolonialism. But at least uh, these are processes uh, which uh, allow to shed uh, the political empire uh, without uh, great uh, economic uh, duress uh, for the metropolitan societies. In the same way, uh, in, in the metropolitan um, cities uh, eventually uh, had a great uh, inflow of labor from the colonies, even though some people resented it, but it certainly served the purpose of economic development of, of the metropolitan uh, cities and countries. Uh, and uh, eventually that uh, allowed uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the great uh, uh, the consequences of the fall of, an, of a colonial empire. And so uh, the uh, imperial uh, sentiments are, of course, uh, dormant. Uh, Britain uh, could part with a, with a great empire. Uh, um, it could eventually transform itself uh, uh, n not to govern uh, these huge territories of land. But of course, uh, we can see um, uh, the sprouts of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, imperious attitudes, uh, such as uh, over the story of uh, the Falkland Islands, uh, when uh, uh, the uh, British uh, uh, army uh, did uh, uh, everything uh, uh, to restore the British rule over these uh, disputable territories. Uh, and this was done uh, under uh, the great enthusiasm of the British society the, the, with this uh, huge uh, um, imperial um, uh, rapture. Rapture, the rapture enraptured. Uh, we remember how this was uh, done in uh, in uh, in those years, this uh, suddenly, uh, this uh, dormant uh, imperious uh, attitudes uh, sprang to life. So we have to realize that they still uh, are, exist in very latent forms, uh, even in the most developed countries in the world, be it Britain or France. Uh, or uh, let me let me just uh, bring one other example: uh, a German. Uh, 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 person, a very uh, celebrated uh, uh, German uh, politician, uh, an elderly uh, person. Uh, we once uh, had uh, uh, a dinner in Potsdam. 
uh, and we were having a good uh, good uh, wine and he said uh, oh it's from uh, south uh, uh, Western Africa, from our southwestern Africa, said this uh, great uh, German uh, diplomat. And there are many other examples. Uh, some are grotesque, some are just curious. Uh, but uh, the, uh, these are just to attest uh, to the fact that the imperious um, uh, attitudes of mind are dormant even in the most developed countries. So we can see this as a uh, uh, as uh, some sort of a political football, mm, when uh, when uh, the glory of a, of a, of a country still uh, rests upon uh, the uh, glorious history. But of course, uh, the most uh, 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 the greatest exacerbation uh, of imperious attitudes of mind uh, uh, occur in the non-liberal, non-democratic uh, countries. Uh, where an empire, um, by and large, uh, did not uh, bring uh, much use to the metropolitan city or the metropolitan nation. And the Russian Empire, in this sense, is a most vivid example. Uh, but one may also cite the uh, unfortunate example of the sublime port or of the Ottoman Empire. In this sense, uh, the metropolitan nation or the metropolitan uh, 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 cities uh, pretty much feed uh, the empire. Uh, in this way, in the Russian um, Empire, in the old Russian Empire, uh, the uh, state uh, expenditures uh, uh, in uh, the uh, in the golden heart of Russia uh, was about 20 percent lower than than the Russian expenditures in the Caucasus and the same ratio was uh, uh, upheld in the Soviet Union Empire is needed for very different purposes not for economic persons not as a source of raw materials the empire is needed either for absolutely irrational purposes such as retaining the unity of uh, homogeneous in the uh, nations that have the same religion, which never works because every empire has different religions because Russia always considers itself as an orthodox country, uh, Ottoman Empire as Sunni Islamic, Austrian Empire as Roman Catholic. Another purpose which comes to mind is that people are absolutely absolutely enjoy, delight in having power. The rulers usually delight in that. The societies, yes, have to pay for the swim, but the rulers take delight in governing huge countries. And thirdly, this is a strategic objective, so that, again, which was typical for the times when people were carried away with geopolitics, it's that empires are safer. Empires are safer because your, your government, your rule, will stay when you control the great heartland. Certainly, the third objective now became an illusion because novel military weapons, which, well, which uh, appeared in the 20th and 21st centuries, destroyed the idea of heartland, and Mackinder recognized that in his latest works. In his latest book, published in 1943 about the integrity of the world, and uh, what rem remains is this this delight in power. In, but what happens is here it's what matters most for our seminar: the objective of indoctrinating mass consciousness. You must convince people that this is something not that the ruler needs. It's something that the people need. You see, it's very difficult because unless you convince them, then people will say, look, for which silly purpose we need your empire? We don't want to give our lives for that. Let others live their own lives. And why do we need to, we Turks, need to, well, rule Arabic lands? Why we Russians need to rule Ukrainians and let them build their own labs. But you need to explain that the, the, it is the other way around. And this idea of national grandeur, when, which doesn't give you a copic of uh, profit, unlike liberal empires, it's being indoctrinated 
into the minds of society. This is my, one of its main objectives. Remember, in the Soviet terms, again, uh, uh, some people enjoyed the thought that his country has one-sixth or one-seventh of the inhabited land, that we are the strongest, that every, we are feared, that our emperor is the greatest, and so on and so forth. Well, that is very actively, again, if they had a, in the old uh, Russian school, if you looked at those books for peasant children, those ideas would certainly be there. Certainly that was also true for the Soviet time. And the society is raised as the, the empire is a value. For many generations, beginning with old Russia, and until now, and um, this, this idea is really, is really fascinating people, and it turns the society away from the much needed objective of building its own love. So the knowledge how to put the pressure on this bruise and uh, this is a special art and a special skill. So pressure was really very artfully put on this point, first in the war with Georgia in 2008 and later in the war with Ukraine in February, March 2014, which provoked an incredible, something that was utterly unexpected. I really didn't expect that. Enthusiasm in society, which is now declining because they now saw the result, the article of all this. But it was certainly there. In my view, this is an absolute fact that we can perceive. And the same might be is true of other countries. For example, one of the best sinologists who teaches a lot in China tells, look, I am traveling riding a taxi from the airport to Beijing. I talk to the taxi driver, cab driver, he's a Chinese, whereas the taxi driver says, well, Putin is such a great guy. We wish we could have somebody like this. But look, is your rule of worse? Well, ours are all fearful of those Americans. We should have captured Taiwan long ago, whereas yours captured Crimea, whereas ours is keep, you know, uh, fearful. Oh, you've got a strong guy, unlike ours. You see, well, why a taxi driver in China, why does he care about Taiwan? Well, certainly life is very nice, even better than in mainland China. So it's not concern for the people of Taiwan. It's rather this molly coddling, this um, imperial feeling that was raised in the previous decades. This is something that makes, well, person in the street in China as well as in Russia enjoy and take delight in the senseless accessions. And, and uh, this is where we must ask ourselves a question. An empire is the reality of rule of one over others that goes back into our conscious. Ruling which, well, every mind is very keen, keen to um, do bad things. I'm not a Russoist who feels that wild man is um, perfect. As a person who studied history, I certainly know that a savage is not at all good. But this is what the mass media, amongst other things, have to work on. And here the question is, we see is alternative. The thing is not about mainland China. In Taiwan, too, many people also are very sad that Taiwan and China are not one country. It's not all, but many. Uh, we see many letters, uh, letters that I get from Ukraine with letters of support, as well as I get many letters with very opposite view from Ukrainian, from most heartland, from Paul Talva and Chernyugov, saying, look, we had an excellent country and uh, we, had, we were never an empire. We enjoyed our life back in the terms of the Soviet Union. Moreover, I can sense it, these moods in other parts of the former Soviet empire, Russian empire, not at all. 
uh, Slavic, such as Aziri, Kazakhs, and Uzbeks, repeatedly told me, repeatedly wrote to me, and as I contemplated this, I came to the conclusion that people, apart from this disgusting of something that is really very tickling, uh, this feeling of dominance, there is yet another feeling which is actually very good. They're craving to cooperation, to live in peace together, to living, to, to, to working together, to creation. And when people remember this historic experience of joint cohabitation and joint work, they really regret having lost that. I will remember that back in the 1960s, 1970s, I was as a young boy, I thought, uh, started thinking how the British Empire works. Some Indians who traveled to Russia to whom I talked told me that, look, we regret that regret parting with the English, so we should have kept some ties, given that since 1956 was a dominion and um, India was a republic and Ceylon remained as a dominion for much longer than, well, I think we should have really kept things in place. This thought was very much alive in the minds of many people. Well, nowadays it's n no longer feasible, but this is the thought that is still lingering. And you know, the English implemented it. They implemented it in one of the most brilliant, as I say it, projects of political projects of the 20th century. This is the British Commonwealth. Very much like any um, human uh, creation, it has its shortcomings, it has its crisis, like the uh, South African Union, but with India and Pakistan, but actually this is a solution. I won't go deep into the Commonwealth construction. I suppose this is something that deserves a separate lecture, and I certainly should not be a reader, should be maybe a British speaker. And uh, look at what eventually came to the EU. It was also a commonwealth of its own kind. It's also a union of nations who uh, could use to fight each other and pour seas of blood. If you go across the Rhine and move from Germany to France or the other way round, do you not ever recall that on these banks, these banks saw millions of lives lost during both on the German and French side for the idea of domination over Alsace and Lorraine. And nowadays nobody really notices having crossed the national border. And few people remember that Alsace and Lorraine, Lotharing now belong to France, and the Germans, extreme nationalists, they might be very upset about this. So the problem has been addressed. It has been addressed, although, yes, uh, there are some people who are all after the national state, and they write to me, say, look, God, national state is OK, but then get ready for the Third World War in Europe. National states, uh, nation states are never canceled. France is still there with its own history, education system, principles, economy, politics. Germany has very much remained the same with a very different system of education and education, yet things that are unthinkable in France, such as Christian Christian uh, tax is real in Germany, and it's not um, something to make anybody upset, but they belong to the same commonwealth. Again, let me put it this way. Well, a more rigid form of commonwealth, and the more rigid, therefore, the more shortcomings are certainly the United States of America that are getting more and more multi-ethnic, and certainly the Republic of India, which has many ethnicities, a very sophisticated company, a country, sorry, they've got a lot of problems. Yes, but they don't want to, nobody wants to secede. Tamil Nadi, in its time, well, they run out of their resources. They want to stay together. That's surprising, but it is a fact. And uh, I suppose that the Commonwealth, or Sadrushistva, as it's known in, a Russian. It's an alternative to the empire. The difference between the Commonwealth and the empire lies only one thing. In the empire, in an empire, imperial people rule over others without their consent, whereas in the Commonwealth, the nations, the people come together on their own and to such an extent to which they're interested and find it good for themselves. This is the only difference, and this is where I think that this natural human wish to, of unification, of coming together, 
which uh, is being distorted in the period project and always leads to disaster. So the idea of Commonwealth is the alternative to that, which is in line with people's profound wish to cooperate. And cooperate is something that necessarily requires that part of your rules, rights, and and uh, should go to supranational structures. Otherwise, there will be no such thing as cooperation. Then it will not really be there. So the Commonwealth and Empire are alternative to each other. Now, do let us look into the last part of my deliberations. They have to do with, or rather, the one before last. Well, this has to do how this has been happening in Russia. How Russia came about with imperious mindset, why is it so strong? The thing is that in Russia, this imperial mindset is came uh, to rise in Velikorossi, not in Russia, in Velikorossi, in the 15th century, this idea of Moscow as the third Rome. At that time, it had no like sort of spatial dimension. It was not an empire in the sense of the word as we perceive it nowadays, as an empire as a certain space. At that time, it was purely ideological, but ideological certainly matters matter greatly for the empire. Again, this is a subject in its own right. I'll touch it in passing only. In today's lecture, as you know, the idea that Moscow is the third room is when we first see it rising under Ivan III after Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, uh, 54, if I'm not mistaken, says the speaker, uh, by the Turks and after the, well, the end of the Byzantine Empire and an attempt by Byzantium at the very 11th hour to I conclude a union with the Catholic Church at the Ferrara Council to stay alive. As we know, nothing came out of it. And this is where Russia comes with an idea that since Byzantium died, perished, as a result of this attempt to conclude a union well, with Catholics, wrong-believing Catholics, it's clear that the Greeks uh, really ha did everything to promote hatred towards Catholicism in Russia. Now only, the only thing that only Moscow is the only is that this is the Orthodox Christian Church and Kiev is under the rule of Lithuania. Lithuania is in union with Poland that is Catholic in the second half of the 15th century. Lithuania is becoming more and more Catholic, so Moscow is the only state which is this stronghold of Orthodox world. And Philophius writes from the monastery to Basil III, you are the only one, like Noah in the Ark, have been saved, whereas others perished. The first Rome fell, the other, the second uh, first has been captured by Muslims, others are captured by Catholics. You are the only one who should preserve this orthodox belief and the orthodox country. Yes, Russia is poor, is surrounded by uh, seemingly with enemies, and this complex of an enemy is getting stronger in the society. The society is uh, cherishing it in the society, let alone under Ivan the Terrible, it's becoming more and more despotic. But the supreme purpose is to preserve the Orthodox Tsar and kingdom. And people realize that no sacrifice at all would, should be considered excessive to retain the most important thing, our Orthodox belief. And hence what follows is Oprichnina, uh, uh, what uh, what Ivan the Third did in uh, the writers' uh, writers' depredations and atrocities in Ivan the Third in Pskov, but all that is accepted and adopted for the sake of the great Orthodox kingdom. And this idea was very strong, and people to a great extent cherished it. 
Well, and we'll see how surprisingly this idea came to be implemented in 200 years. In times of trouble, all that disappears. Orthodox values remain, but quite the opposite. The first czars in Romanov's um, dynasty, they want to make Russia open to the world. Very much in the, as Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich writes in his correspondent, he says, you are Russian, you should really defend our Russia. Yes, but I have Greek belief that what this is what and this correction in the books, clerical books, this is an idea to become a Catholic in a universal, global force. Uh, that is something that is getting stronger under the children of Alexei Mikhailovich, under Alexius and Sophia, this openness to the world, instead of being closed against the empire disappears in the concepts of Russia in the 17th century. Think is about reunification of old Russian lands, Ukraine and Belarus, where he assumes the title of the Tsar of the greater, smaller, and white Rus. But this is not an imperial idea. In that context, they are the ideas of, let me put it the way, of the Commonwealth, actually. Commonwealth of the individual parts of the state, although the verbiage, the verbiage for us is something unusual, but overall we have like councils and the autonomy of Ukraine, which was observed under Alexis Mikhailovich and until the times of Peter the Great. Well, um, the alternative to that was an imperial recurrence where, I mean, in the mindset was among old believers. They were old believers who claimed all those Greek books, falsitudes, and were ready to die for our Russian, sometimes senseless and uh, erroneous, following the rights in the right manner. And they would give out their lives by thousands. They would burn themselves. And the government also treated them, well, you know, in the Russian manner. So the carriers of that idea of exclusiveness, uh, they were the old believers. Uh, the 18th and 19th century brought about a new idea mentioned by Lenin Mikhailovna Karamzin, but certainly it came about much sooner, much earlier, under Peter I. And after him, this idea of a purely secular empire, purely secular empire that is great in its grandeur. For the sake of that empire, anything goes. In order for capturing the Baltics in the North War, you could you know, you know, kill a huge number of people to build St. Petersburg, to create military works and factories in Urals and to start fleet under New Voronezh. Empire is all, man is nothing. And the difference between the old time, well, nothing like Third Rome, nobody cares about Third or Fourth Rome. Empire is uber alles. It's equal to itself. This is a classical, classical way of ruling for this dominance for the sake of dominance. And the follower is Catherine II, who was the conductor, another very outstanding conductor of the idea of Peter. It's for good reason that the monument by Fulconer, this continuity of tradition of thinking between Peter and Catherine, the empire for the sake of the empire, for its own purpose, and for that idea it served him, for no other reason but that. It is for the empire that the Russian people are continuing to be in the illiterate condition. Even Russian gentry lives a very hard life. A risk nobility, yes, they enjoy grand life, but all others for the sake of the empire. And the acme of that new empire was the when the Russian troops entered Paris in 1812 under Alexander I. And uh, the empire turned out to be the greatest empire in the world. For the first time, and for the only time probably in the history of Russia, the Russian empire became the grandest empire of all. And it is the one that is dictating the thinking in the world. It creates the holy 
uh, union, but all that is very soon lost. But through the complete disregard for its own um, structure, and Alexander the second begins a very um, a very difficult path, which actually failed, of going back from empire to commonwealth until 1863 to the second rising in Poland. Um, they uh, allowed allowed a lot of um, advances uh, w with Ukraine. They publish Russo-Ukrainian magazines, and Alexander was really frightened. And uh, they want to create again, make a separate kingdom out of Poland instead of it being a province. Well, Alexander is a liberal even in this liberal policy, but pretty soon he changes. Well, under Alexander III, it completely stops. And um, Pyotr Alkadzic Stalipin also continues the policy of imperial uh, silliness, if we think at how he wanted to address the Finnish question. So the last part when the Russian Empire existed, this is merging of two trends, merge of two trends. economic and political. Yes, there are attempts to create commonwealth. For that matter, the elections to the Duma number one and number two followed the election law where uh, they had representatives from Central Asia, Poland, and Caucasus, whereas elections to Duma three and four were done in much abridged principle of uh, what they were known as uh, indigenous dwellers. Uh, Central Asia didn't have any representatives, Yakutia didn't have any representatives, and Yakutia is a very exciting commonwealth, if you ask me, that has its own original self-consciousness. And, uh, and in the long run, it being resolved in the revolution. Well, the Soviet state goes through two stages. They're both imperial periods, but in all the prior history of Russia, it sort of was concisely seen in the 70 years of Soviet state. First period, pre the 17th Congress of the party, was the period of, say, ideological empire, empire as an idea, as the third bow, for, well, obvious reasons, communi communist ideas, Comintern, as a global idea, and its monument for the Soviet time is the emblem of the Soviet Union, where they don't see the Russia, we see the globe with superimposed hammer and sickle. That was an empire. For the sake of that empire, they were ready to take any sacrifices for the sake of world revolution. And uh, so that Russia is the source uh, and the uh, nurse bed of the world revolution. Well, uh, after that, it, it becomes a very different rather in the classical of the Petersburg type dominance for the sake of dominance uh, and very much if you will this is very much like something not the motivational goal to create empire for its own purpose for its own end and Stalin in this way achieves great success as he said openly to Molotov we have recreated the Russian Empire. We have recovered that because of the pact of Molotov-Ribbentrop and the implementation. So, well, later it expands to Central Europe up to 1945. Russian and Soviet Empire becomes a territorial empire. But please note that imperial matters prevail over Commonwealth. The peoples did not want this Soviet empire. The peoples 
the nations uh, may have uh, wanted uh, cooperation, but probably they don't want even the cooperation. They just want to flee. They want to, and when when this uh, uh, iron Soviet reign disappeared, everybody ran away. Just ran away. The East Europe uh, um, immediately. Um, fled uh, in the direction of the Western Europe. Uh, the former, uh, the former Soviet republics, uh, uh, and even um, parts of the Russian Federation started uh, to have uh, secessionist uh, tendencies. The republics immediately seceded, but uh, then the the process uh, stopped, uh, and uh, today. Uh, we are seeing, uh, as the Russian Federation uh, has a state in its um, uh, borders, but uh, as I already said, in 2014, President Putin attempted uh, to um, uh, cause uh, and uh, to push this imperious uh, attitude of mind button and uh, indeed uh, uh, to a great success um, of this renaissance of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Im Im imperial attitudes. So this uh, phenomenon is uh, quite uh, important and uh, strong. The only thing to contrast it uh, with is the principle of commonwealth. However, the principle of commonwealth cannot uh, be based on the empty words. Uh, if uh, empires are built upon guns and uh, and uh, oil and gas uh, blackmail, um, and it is uh, based on uh, financial aid to the likes of Mr. Lukashenko, the commonwealth must be based upon something else. Uh, it must be based. Uh, upon three principles, um, uh, which in general uh, are uh, oriented or directed towards uh, one's own people. The Commonwealth is not how the uh, uh, notion about yourself is changed with other nations, but uh, how and what will you become yourself. The European Union evolved because uh, Robert Schumann and others uh, changed uh, uh, the mind of the French and uh, Adenauer uh, uh, helped uh, the Germans to change uh, their mindset. Uh, the great uh, uh, British humanists uh, changed uh, the public opinion about India. Uh, and Indians, um, and many Indians uh, viewed uh, the metropolitan power differently, too. What does Russia need in this sense, and what tasks does Russia see, uh, as well as what do you uh, have uh, to see as uh, tasks ahead, as uh, people who will be uh, responsible for Russia's uh, tomorrow? The first task is uh, to uh, indeed uh, um, have an appeal uh, and uh, every person must be indeed involved with the actual businesses of the day. Only this uh, could uh, change uh, people's uh, mindset uh, and uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, this way uh, and only this way will people be able to abolish uh, this political football mentality uh, while one is just watching on the TV in quite a p passive way how the great politics uh, unfold. So the only thing that we can see is uh, this personalistic, highly individual approach uh, to life, uh, something, a life project um, uh, uh, that, that the liberal empires uh, have been able to instill in their people, in their nations, when people were primarily uh, concerned with their own uh, business. And of course, uh, if people think about the fate of the empire first, uh, then then uh, people are ready to uh, to sell their last cow and go to war uh, for the uh, Grenada uh, proletarian republic to to come to fruition, as uh, the Bolsheviks uh, were happy to try and persuade people of. Uh, well, we know that there were quite a few uh, volunteers in Donbas. Uh, 
uh, because of this inebriation with the propaganda. Uh, and uh, one has uh, to be uh, trying to expand uh, and create uh, this space uh, of people minding their own business, uh, of uh, uh, something that was done in the Eastern Europe, uh, something that we saw as, as, uh, as the people of, uh, of the Eastern European countries uh, were able to shift uh, from, from lofty ambitions uh, to uh, really everyday um, everyday uh, concerns uh, that people have uh, to do to make their lives, their individual lives, better. So this is the only recipe against the imperial problem. This is the only way uh, uh, to for us uh, to try and uh, do away with this uh, with this highly dangerous imperial uh, way of thinking. The other way and the other recipe is uh, 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 heightening of the civic consciousness uh, when um, your ambitions are primarily directed uh, uh, at uh, uh, self-government and uh, making your town, making your municipality uh, better, then the ideas of empire will not be as appealing. Indeed, there's a great deal of difference uh, 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 between cases uh, when uh, a tyranny uh, makes politics and a democratic government makes politics. So uh, the other important moment is the social political uh, dimension. We have to create a new society within ourselves. This is the only way to uh, to liquidate uh, the uh, imperial uh, complex. And of course, the third uh, recipe is uh, the development of uh, educational system. I would certainly recommend an article written in 1939, written by one of our best uh, uh, um, uh, Russian emigre philosophers, uh, uh, Georgi Fedotov. He writes uh, um, about uh, the Russian-Ukrainian relations in 1938, and he's saying that, of course, this empire, we have, uh, we have uh, indeed uh, um, uh, demolished uh, uh, the good spirit of the relations between the Russian and the Ukrainian peoples by imposing ourselves upon the Ukraine. We have uh, 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 not been able to notice uh, 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 that how the great Euro Euro Ukrainian nation was being formed in the 17th and 18th century. This is a great mistake of intelligentsia, of the Russian intelligentsia, Fedotov writes in this 1939 article. And he says, we have to look at the foundations of the Ukraine, we, the Russians. We have to look at the history of the Ukraine, not from Moscow, but from Kiev or from Lviv. Uh, from, uh, we have to see uh, who are the people whom the Ukrainians call their heroes. And if these heroes and purposes, historical ends, uh, have been kindred to the Ukrainians, we have to embrace these. We have to understand who was Mazepa for these people. Bogdan Khmelnytsky is, of course, much closer to us as the Russians, but Mazepa is for some reason valuable to the Ukrainians. So we have to understand this. And then he speaks about architecture of the Mazepa time and so on and so forth. And he brings some examples uh, uh, from from uh, from uh, the English history. He says that uh, uh, England and Scotland uh, can only live under one crown uh, in one country because uh, uh, the heroes uh, for the English and the Scottish uh, became British heroes. And the people uh, who fought uh, for the uh, British Empire also stayed to be in the pantheon of heroes. And of course, I will add something that Fedotov could not simply say in 1938, is that the relations between Britain and India became amiable and possible at all is that such people as Gandhi are heroes for the British people, people even though they were um, uh, counteracting and uh, the British and the English uh, have found uh, the great great uh, courage for uh, for um, uh, 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 Lord Mountbatten to follow the hearse uh, for Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and uh, 
the heroes of the Sipai revolt uh, are also recognized, uh, uh, even though uh, they, they fought against uh, uh, the British. Uh, at the same time, the British officers, uh, uh, you can see that uh, their names uh, are venerated uh, and, uh, and they're celebrated. So what we have to learn is that we have to try and look at the history of other as our own history without refuting, without, uh, without uh, of course, uh, being overly critical and um, uh, disparaging our own uh, history. It is clear that uh, the Russians, the great Russians, uh, Velikoros, so the people of uh, Russia, um, have a great tradition of venerating uh, the so-called white guard generals of the white generals of the civil war. Um, the Ukrainians, on the other hand, believe that the white generals were the imperial generals, and they are not ready to to uh, uh, view them as uh, as uh, great heroes. They uh, certainly have a greater sympathy for Skaropatsky or for Petlura. So we have to understand what are these names uh, to this to these people. We have to try and understand what is there that we can understand. There may be little things to understand, uh, but uh, and there may be crimes uh, uh, that they have committed. But however, we have to see what is the verve of the Ukrainian nation, of the Ukrainian people. This, in my view, is the way to transform the imperious mindset, which is detrimental uh, to Russia and to its neighbors. Uh, indeed, um, uh, uh, this is the only way for us to change this uh, to the Commonwealth mentality, to the Commonwealth type of thinking, which may only instill new energy uh, into both our country and uh, the countries uh, which uh, are historically related to Russia. And an example of, uh, of, the, of the British Commonwealth and of the European Union should probably serve as the best possible examples uh, today. Thank you. Thank you.